If you watch the movie Invictus, or even if you haven't watched the movie uh, yet, you probably have heard of this man by the name of Francois Pinard, who together with, uh, under the leadership of Mr. Nelson Mandela, uh, helped guide South Africa to uh, becoming the rainbow nation that it is today, uh, using the game called rugby. And uh, we are very fortunate and very pleased, actually, to share with you some thoughts from Mr. Francois Pinard. Welcome, Francois. I'll start with my first question, Francois. Thank you for coming and agreeing to be uh, to spend some time with us today. Could you describe the uh, relationship you had with uh, with Mr. Nelson Mandela? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be in Malaysia. You're welcome. And you start with the easy questions first. Of I course. see. <laughs> um, it's a very personal relationship. You know, there's the public relationship that people saw mm -hmm. a statesman and a sportsman, right. and. Um, and how we have, were so blessed to share the same platform together, to stand on a podium when our country came together for the first time in its history. That's right. Very powerful. And that was the, that's the public um, side of it. But the personal one for me is more endearing. Um, the relationship after the Rugby World Cup that I had with Mr. Mandela, when there was nothing to gain politically from being in a friendship with me. Um, incredible stories. Mr. Mandela was known to have said that it was you was responsible for making South Africans unite during the World Cup season. Could well, you comment on that a little bit? Well, it was him. <laughs> yes. I was on the platform with Mr. Mandela when he handed me the trophy, and what I couldn't believe was his words. So I stood up um, to walk onto the stage and get the trophy from him, and he, he stuck out his hands and he said to me, Francois, thank you for what you've done for South Africa. And I was so overwhelmed by it, I didn't, you know, I didn't know what to do. But my only response was, thank you, Mr. Mandela, for what you've done for South Africa. And I thought I should hug him because I wanted to hug him. But because of a state spirit protocol, I didn't. I wish I did. You wish you did? I wish I did, yes. Were there any... any I'm going to bring you back to the, uh, the conversation to, uh, to focus on the movie um, uh, Invictus. Yes. Um, that starred Morgan Freeman and, and, and uh, Matt Damon playing the role of Francois Pinard. Which, which scenes in the movie are, are true to you and, and which ones are more iconic in, in the sense that they are very meaningful to you and true at the same time? There's two. Okay. The one on Robben Island, when uh, Matt Damon walks into Robben Island. Yes. It was after we played Australia in the opening match. The whole team went to Robben Island for the first time with their partners and um, it was a very emotional experience. Now, the World Cup has just started. We've won our first game against the odds because Australia were the favourites to win. Um, not New Zealand, as many people thought, but Australia were undefeated. Yes. And after beating them, we went to Robben Island and I was the last guy to walk into Mr Mandela's cell. I've never been to Robben Island. And um, when I walked into his cell, um, it just, the enormity of it struck me. Uh, how small the cell was. And when I stuck out my hands, I could touch the walls. And then I looked through the bars of, of the cell and there was nothing, you know. And I realized that Mr. Mandela was there for 17 years on that island. And when he came out, he had forgiveness in his heart. It was incredibly emotional. So when the first time I saw the scene in, um, in Invictus in L.A. Um, at the premiere, I couldn't stop crying because it such, had such an impact on me. Um, it had then. And when I saw it again, it just um, it was incredibly emotional. So that, that is an indelible memory um, where Mr. Mandela wasn't present, but he was present. You know, his aura was there. You could you, sense him. You, you could, could sense, you him. could feel him. You could, I mean, it was just incredibly powerful. You know, and that, that makes you more resolute um, and determined. And obviously, when he gave me the World Cup, was probably the, I mean, I, his beautiful smile and his hands aloft, and he was yes. so proud that day but not as proud as, as we were as, as a team. Um, and in the scenes, in the movie they try and describe the scenes after, uh, after the victory. Yes. They failed miserably because the scenes were far more powerful, They're far, more, far more genuine, far more... It was incredible scenes of pure joy, um, uh, of forgiveness of people for the first time in their history celebrating together and some tremendous stories even 20 years later mm. that I'm privileged to um, people tell me their stories and whenever they tell me their story it, it humbles me that I was just so lucky I, I say it um, unashamedly and, and without trying to 
uh, e evoke any kind of emotion but the no, fact no. that I was incredibly lucky. I'm probably the luckiest sports person alive. Nobody has had an opportunity like I've had as, as the fortunate leader of a national team to meet uh, the fortunate leader of the world, which is Mr. Mandela's image, you know, right. his image of reconciliation and forgiveness and passion. Did you even have a clue uh, of the impact that the 1995 World Cup uh, activities would have on the rest of the world? No. Uh, many, many years after that. No. Never. Um, couldn't imagine, I could not have imagined it. I think I would have been <laughs> too scared <laughs> if we realised the impact and, and what it could do. Uh, and maybe that's why it's so special. No, I, even during the World Cup, I didn't realise the enormity of the impact in South Africa. I mm. know that something was happening. I sensed it, but I didn't. I was not prepared for the impact. I don't even think Mr. Mandela had an idea. Actually, no, he had an idea, but he. I mean, it. It was the impact was incredible. It was just um, phenomenal. You know, it was almost a miracle. Mm. Um, I, I'm sure during some of the times when you were leading the team, trying to put the team together, to walk towards the same path, towards that mission that Man Mr. Mandela set in your mind, there were times when you were most absolutely lonely because some of your teammates were not really uh, uh, supporting you at that point in time yet. And I'm sure you felt a bit lonely, a, a bit shaken sometimes, I would imagine. What was your source of strength in those quietest of moments, loneliest of times? No, I'm a very spiritual person um, and that's always been my strength. But in the team there was a powerful force and that was the whole team. Our management was magnificent. Um, our manager, Mourne Duplessis, also played for the Springboks. Yes. Incredible gentleman and a great visionary. But I think the key was our coach, um, Kitch Christie. Um, incredible man. He had cancer for 18 years. And even in 1993, um, he was incredibly sick and people thought that he would, he would pass. Right. Right. So he departed knowledge. You can only imagine, if you know that your runway is short, you yes. know that your runway is is going to stop. Yeah. Um, the knowledge that you would that you would pass is just incredible. So the, the strength came from within, mm. um, and and from my you know from my religion. Could you tell us a bit about how, how you grew up as as a child in, in South Africa? How could that have probably shaped you into the person that you are now and the values that you hold so dear to yourself right now? I think it's actually ironic. Because the way I grew up in South Africa, in Afrikaans community, right. I only spoke Afrikaans, yes. uh, went to an Afrikaans school, never saw black people in the school. Um, you know, when you uh, are fairly good at sport when you grow up, the invariable question is, is he good enough to play for the Springboks? Because the ultimate is to play for the Springboks. And Afrikaners, we love our rugby. Um, so when I grew up, Mandela was a terrorist. He was a bad man. Yes. Mandela was... Um, you know, if he came out of jail, we were in trouble. And that's how I grew up, listening to this from my parents and their friends and sort of believing it because as children in South Africa, the way we grew up, children are, are seen and not heard. You're not part of the conversation, uh, which obviously I've changed. So ironically, when I went to university, um, meeting people from different religions, cultures, and also persuasions, um, my life morphed and changed. Well, then you start asking questions. Right. I never asked questions when I was a, a, a kid because you just don't. Um, so growing up from where, hearing that Mr. Mandela is, is a terrorist and if the ANC come in power under him that it will be the worst thing that happened to our country to the best thing ever to happen to our country was a, was a tremendous journey. Sometimes I don't understand that journey. Um, it was just such a fortunate journey that I was part of. Mm. But I wish I could sit here in front of you and say that I asked those questions. And um, as a kid, I, um, I didn't. And uh, my children will never be in that position. Wow. You were somehow inadvertently dropped from the team. Um, the year following the World Cup. Am I right? Yeah, I'm right. 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 And you never played my for My first time ever. That's right. And though they came back to you for you after that, you've never put on the Springboks jersey again for the, uh, until today. Could you tell us a little bit more what happened from your side? Well, what happened, in, listen, there's always very, several sides to the story, of so course. I'm glad you say from my side. Um, after the World Cup, the game turned professional. In, during the World Cup, it was, we were amateurs. Correct. Before the World Cup, it cost me money to play rugby. Uh, and I wouldn't change it for the world. You know, we were... 
we were adrenaline junkies. Uh, to run out in front of 50, 60, 70,000 people was just the most incredible thing. And we did it for no money. You know, they would give us a bit of pocket money, but it wasn't professional. So after 95, the game turned professional. And I was in the middle of negotiating professionalism. And uh, I was seen as the shop steward. So um, when did that game did prof turn professional, I fell out with the administrators, um, many of them still from 1995. And I got dropped for the first time in my life, I'll never forget it, against the All Blacks in Cape Town uh, at Newland Stadium. We were leading 18 points to six, oh, and wow. the next thing I woke up was in the hospital. So I, got, I was concussed, and then I learned that I was not going to be part of the next new coach, they brought in a new coach. And I agreed with that because, you know, uh, coaches need to have leaders, and if there's no synergy between them, the team won't perform. There needs to be synergy and there needs to be a collective view and vision and a value system that mm -hmm. you both support. And ours didn't connect. So um, that was the last time I played for the Springboks, sadly. Um, mm -hmm. It was, I didn't leave the field on my shoes, I left it on a stretcher. I see, and you left for England subsequently after that. It was interesting, you know, I had a small business then and I was going to go back into business. Mm -hmm. um, I studied law at the University of Johannesburg, got two, two law degrees. But my coach and mentor sat me down and he said to me, I'm crazy. He said, I should go abroad. The game turned professional and I got offers to go to um, three clubs in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, Leicester, Saracens and, and uh, Richmond. I heard that we didn't want to go to Leicester because if you go abroad, you want to live in a city and experience a city. So we were going to go for a year, maybe two years. We didn't go for money. It wasn't uh, you know, that we were going for, for the pound. In actual fact, I, did a, I, didn't, I don't think I did a good deal. Mm -hmm. We were going for the experience. And that's what my coach and mentor said to me. He said, you will grow. Um, it was tough in the beginning. The club wasn't doing well. And then I, I became player coach. And for the first time in 127 years, we won the first trophy, which was another huge highlight. In, in my life. Um, so the London experience, I went to Saracens because people said to me that the guy that has put the money into Saracens, the one in Watford, right? In Watford. Right. He's a good guy. Now, fast forward, I'm still on the board of Saracens. I'm actually, I see Nigel a lot. Um, it's a magnificent journey in my life. And the six and a half years we spent in London, it's probably the best thing I've done in terms of how I've grown as a person, you know, yes, in terms yes. of growing up my at, um mm -hmm. in school in South Africa, going to university, and then seeing a bit of the world, and then going to live yeah. in the world. How I grew as a person has just been, uh, I'm very blessed. What do you say is the, uh, um, the most powerful skill that a leader must have to be successful? Vision, it's vision. If a leader doesn't have vision, um, then, there's no road. <laughs> what was the your vision during the World Cup? To win. I mean, even before then, um, again, my side of the story, yes. but you can ask people. My, my fiancé was working in a legal firm, uh, Mayer Smith and Lowndes, and one of the partners actually represented Mr. Mandela, uh, with his father in the treason trial in Ravonia. And whenever she came to work, two, three months before the World Cup, and bearing in mind, we were not given, um, we were not favourites, you know, there were teams there that were far more, um, um, they think, competent to win than, than us. Maybe not competent is the right word, but they, they were seated much better than us. And Irene would come to the office and she would say, Francois says they're going to win. And they say, really? She says they're going to win. I believed it. Um, Absolutely. I, I visioned myself standing on that platform holding the cup. I, I lived it, I dreamt it, I slept it, I trained it. It was, but it wasn't me. That was, you know, we all did it. They bought into, the team bought into the one, a team, one country vision. Is that we're doing it for not only ourselves and for our families, but we're doing it for something bigger than ourselves and for our country as such. But we didn't understand the impact. You know, we, we, we thought it would have an impact, but not, not um, the enormity um, that it had. Without being disrespectful to your friendship with Mr. Mandela, could you share with us one very personal moment with him that's really meaningful? Oh, there's several. Um, the one that... Uh, well, there's a couple that was in, obviously in the public domain. But after we won the World Cup, um, we were celebrating the successes and we were invited to a, um, a big celebration at the Union Buildings in Pretoria. And Mr. Mandela obviously was the guest of honor, and I greeted him when he arrived, and um, protocol, and I 
I then mentioned my fiancé's name once. He's Nareen. incredible with names, Nareen. I said yes. to him, Mr. Mandela, do you mind if I introduce my fiancé, Nareen, to you through the course of the evening? And he said, ah, Francois, no problem. And I took him to the main table. We were not seated at the main table because I wanted to be with my, my mates, you know. And we were celebrating life. You can imagine. And we've won the World Cup. That's Our dreams right. have come true. And life is good. Life and, is and really... And rugby players are not known for, for, <laughs> for colourful language. Can, <laughs> we, can, we can celebrate. We, yes, you can. Uh, I don't have hair left now, but we can let our hair down. <laughs> Pretty good so far. And uh, I am... Um, I completely forgot about the fact that I wanted to introduce Mr. Mandela to, to Noreen. And at the close of the evening, uh, when he was leaving, because it was getting fairly late, he walked straight to our table, walked past me and took my fiancé's hand and he said to Noreen, will you feel offended if I come to your wedding? Wow. I mean, he, she, I mean she just melted, like, I mean, she melted when he touched her hand, but I when he, when he said myself. that, yeah. and he did, he came, we didn't make a big thing about it, he came with, with, with his daughter Zinzi. Uh, most incredible photographs. Um, I mean, there's many stories that I've been so fortunate. You know, having, sure. having lunches with Mr. Mandela and Grasa, and the conversations we've had was just incredibly special. But I, I, I'm, I tend not to try and share those because yes. then it, it loses a bit of its appeal. Um, but this was a very special. Uh, Besides Mr. Me. Mandela, you probably are the second most popular or most famous South African uh, in the world. Well, you know I. If, if I am, and, and there are many famous South Africans, great people, business people, and, and sports people, and um, social workers, there's some wonderful people. Actresses. So if I am actresses, and, but if I am, it's because of my team, uh, and because of Mr. Mandela, and because of our coach, and because of my management um, behind us. You know, that's, I, was, I was but the, um, the, the lucky one. Where do you get your source of energy, both physical and emotional? I don't know. Um, I, I think it's my moral compass and, and my, 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 my faith. Um, it has, definitely has to do with that. But I, I, I love people too. I like people. I like, mm -hmm. I like the goodness in people. And people have energy. Um, people have got, I mean, it's, I sometimes see that if you empower so, certain people in the right way, they just they, take off. They take off and, and that is energizing. Besides Mr. Mandela, who do you look up to? Who's your icon? Well, they both passed away now. Um, Mr. Christie has also passed away. Um, I think if Isaac Newton taught me anything is, um, he said, if you want to see further, you've got to stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes. And my two giants are my two boys, Jean and Stefan Pinar. Mm -hmm. So they're my source of inspiration. And um, um, they're 16 and 15 now. So Any one of them playing rugby? Both, sadly. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> both, sadly, but they also play the violin. Okay. And they row and uh, metro mail, um, a renaissance upbringing. But it's on their shoulders that I see further because I understand what they have to go through in life. You know, they're now going into university soon. And then they were going into the workplace. And this world is a different world. It keeps on changing. So they're my source of inspiration, my, my boys. Francois Pina. Thank you for talking to us today. Thank I you like so it. much. Thank you very much.